Day 6 of the April 2000 seven-day retreat in Springwater. The question of choosing, deciding, willing, vowing, intending has not gone away. The little meeting room last night was full of it. So we will devote some more time. Let us start out by saying that, is, that there is no denying the fact that thought and image are an incredible power in the human mind, in humanity, and that this powerful thought and image leads to powerful action. Our history is full of that action, generated by thought. We have led wars, devastated, countries, each other, exterminated millions of people. Through thinking, imagery about the others, about ourselves, super race, inferior race, powerful images leading to powerful action, believed to be right, true, good, beneficial, or just pleasure, pleasure bringing. We have a, a plaque on the moon and an American flag. I think Nixon's name is up there. <laughs> <laughs> we have satellites zooming through space through space, have incredible computers that can win over the best of our chess players. The human mind has invented rites, rituals, puberty rituals, and inflicted pain that defy the imagination. That's the flip side of rituals. A lot is felt and said in praise of rituals that we don't have anymore. We should reinstate. We're too poor in rituals. I don't mean here, but this day and age. Well, there's another side to it. Years ago, I read in Joseph Campbell's books the amazing bur burial rituals for the king of a country, of a tribe, taking with him all his live wives and possessions and maybe a boat to carry them to the other shore, entombing staff alive with a dead king because of this powerful image of needing to have an afterlife of pleasure and power conceived in this human brain.
and carried out. A, a thought conceived by a person of power will, will just drive for realization, for materialization, to, to put it into action. And we know that ourselves, if there's some energy in us, and we conceive of something nice to do or important to do, we'll do it. We'll bring it about. We brought this place here about. A lot of thought went into it. And we're thinking of adding to it. Increase the capacity. This first has to be experienced, too tight, too little living space, and then thoughts to put it into action. We have vowed everything under the sun to be, to become, to do. And a lot of it has been carried out. Some, some of it successfully, some of it failing. Successful meaning the temple has been built. The cathedral, if you look at some of these cathedrals, it's amazing the structure, it defies against, again, the, the imagination how this is possible and has been possible without these huge cranes that we have now. How did they bring that last bit of embellishment and flying buttresses to the top? Also by thinking that there's not much value to human life if it is sacrificed for the glory of the king of God or the gods. <clears throat> so a lot, of, a lot of human beings must have given their lives for erecting these edifices of worship or for the continuity of the VIPs, the kings, the pharaohs, well, you, you name it. Amazing, amazing capacity to do things based on thinking, on imagining. So, no doubt about it, no question about that. What we're questioning is our age-old conviction that there is somebody behind these thoughts who thinks them, who carries them out, who chooses to carry them out, who chooses to think them. And this invention through thought, erroneous thought, that there is a me behind my thoughts, behind my actions, this erroneous thought has also done its fair share of mischief. So much so that some people feel like in a straitjacket with this me. All of its conflicting tendencies, conflicting thought streams. Should I do this? Should I do that? I've got to make a choice. And because of abstracting the thinking into this chooser of choices, losing the ability to, to see clearly what is going on or blocking it, distorting it. So play, play with it if we're interested. As these meetings show, there is a real interest in this dilemma, this conundrum of me having a choice. Find out what this me is. That is thought to be behind the thinker, behind the thinking as a thinker, behind the doing as a doer. And see if it's possible to observe thought and its actions freshly, with a fresh mind, 
that is not anchored and defensive about this idea of me doing it. To loosen up that concept, that, that conviction. Not have a preconceived idea it's wrong, it must be false, it must be elusive, but come to that realization by oneself through watching, through insight. Maybe through a presence that happens to human beings in which there is no division. That's not a thought, it's a fact, no division, no barriers, no walls, no boundaries. And out of that wholeness, out of that whole vision, one sees the erroneousness of the me as an agent. That becomes clear of itself. One, one can see, or there can be seeing, of the fact that as a me thought arises in this openness, there is potential or actual contraction. And there's a shift, a physical shift, from this relaxed state of openness, which sits low. It doesn't sit up here. It sits low. From that sort of a quick ride to the head. Brain work, associative work happening, interpretive work, knowing work, and connecting back to the entire body with emotions, release of chemicals that have their effect on the entire body and on the thinking. Dwelling in the realm of thinking and imaging, somebody the other day said, was, was relating an insight that this is really like living in an alternate reality. This is how this person called it, if I remember right. It was an amazement in that discovery. Living in the me world, in the thinking, reacting network, is an alternate reality. A reality because it, well, that person said it is real. We have to be careful with saying that. It has a reality to it, that's true. The reality of thinking, emoting, associating, interpreting. And living in that as though it was our only true world. In that alternate reality, we'll keep that world, word for a while, we make lots of choices, and we make them. And we should have known better, or particularly the others should have known better, to choose the way they choose, to act the way they act, put each other into jail, execute each other for these erroneous choices made. In, in that realm, in that alternate reality, which does not have In its enclosed form, it does not have insight. Thought cannot see. Thought cannot see. Insight comes from somewhere else, not from thought. But insight illuminates the action of thought, the activity. So, in if we're enclosed, cut off in this alternate reality of imaging, thinking, remembering, choosing, well then choice seems very, very real. Because we think that way. And because we think that way, we feel that way. It's so obvious that I choose to lift my arm. And your arm didn't lift at this moment. It's this narrow, limited, enclosed way of living without insight. But 
but it's not the only world in which a human being can live. Incidentally, before we go on with that thought, these alternate realities are created by brains, a different one for each one of us. Each one of us has a slightly or very much different alternate reality in which we live. And no wonder we have such a hard time communicating with each other, understanding each other, being in sync with each other, in touch, in really intimate touch with each other. Very difficult because of these <coughs> differing alternate realities <coughs> which come from different individual experiences, think different things happened to you than to me, different things happened to my sister than to me, even though we grew up in the same household, completely different personalities and different worlds. Remember with my sister, we had a good time in our teens, we had very great closeness. Our puberty and sex, she was old and she told me about things that nobody else told me. There was a real uh, uh, comradeship to being fond of, we, we sang together, and made little stage things of up, acts of operas with our music teacher. It was very fine companionship, friendship. So I came to this country and began reading and came upon Alan Watts. And, it, and loved it, gobbled up Alan Watts. And particularly one book struck me, it was Psychotherapy East and West. My sister, meanwhile, had gone through medical school and become a psychoanalyst. And I sent her this book of Alan Watts, Psychotherapy East and West, with great expectations that we, have a new, that we will have a new thing in common. And what a failed expectation. <laughs> She was pissed off, <laughs> angry, judgmental. I couldn't believe it. She had, she had now built up a different world. And we could hardly ever get together on this thing until we stopped arguing about it or trying to convince each other. And at one point, she said, that was, that was a little bit more open statement. She said, you know, I've built a tremendous structure and I cannot break that down. That's my life. There was insight in that. Today we're very close again. We leave the topic alone of psychoanalysis. She has um, quit it anyways three years ago, five years ago. She's very ill. And we have a real closeness again um, without needing to compare notes on this stuff. So this was just an example of these two alternate realities which couldn't communicate with each other very well. So I branched off when I asked, is this the only reality, the only world in which human beings can live? This self-centered, it's not said pejoratively, it's said descriptively, this self-centered network in which each of us is confined due to our differing individual experiences, makeups, a little bit different desires, different and yet all made possible by the very, very similar 
brain and human organism. It just can spin infinitely varied worlds. This brain and the body aids it along. One may not have formulated it to oneself in this particular way, there are infinite possibilities for formulating it, but this is why most of us come to a place like this or to a spiritual training center. We want to find out if this is all there is to our life, this confinement, suffering, pain, repetitiveness, a lot of people suffering from the repeating of patterns endlessly. Is there any escape from that? I remember at the Zen Center on New Year's Eve there was a big um, ceremony. It was, it was a big metal vat put up in front near the altar. And there was some charcoal in it and fire. And one had written down ahead of time one's shortcomings that one wanted to be done with. And we all passed by that vat and dropped in our shortcomings. <laughs> the, pa the paper. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful feeling. People said they felt so clean afterwards. And there was also, somehow or other, I remember one of the main, they were called servers at the time, there were three men sort of in charge, below the Roshi, of course, and one of them, maybe all of us did, I don't remember this, was saying verbatim about sort of repentance and intentions or resolutions. Yeah, we were talking about our resolutions and sort of a quick review of our past transgressions. And this one person, I was very struck by it, he said there isn't a precept, he was a monk, had taken more precepts than the ordinary mortals. <laughs> he said, in, in looking back over this year, there isn't a precept I've taken that I have not transgressed. but then vowing in his resolution to do better in the coming year. There wasn't any movement in that place to look at vow-taking and resolution-making in a fresh way. Although there are, in the tradition, there are amazing teachers. We read from Wang Po, and there's the fifth or sixth patriarch, Wei Nang. I used to read a lot at that time. There was, there was much more liberating words than the ones we heard. So where was I coming from before this digression happened? <laughs> Oh, yeah, is there another reality? Oh, and looking for that is why we come here, to a place like this, to find out whether we can step out of this solitary confinement, which is sort of a, a limited desire. If we, we want to step out of the trouble and the pain the suffering, but we don't want to step out of the pleasure. What's gratifying? What's ego-enhancing? And we don't put it that way, but what the body, mind, as we've gone over now in meetings, is thoroughly addicted, not just to cigarettes and, and drugs and, and um, alcohol. It's addicted to its thoughts that bring pleasure. 
and not just lustful thoughts, and sexual thoughts. Um, I was really amazed after Kyle's passing. How there was missing the pleasures of just being together, seeing him smile over something, pleased, watching a video together and looking over there. And when he smiled, I felt so good. Oh, stepping down out of our living room on the, onto the porch, having our coffee and tea in the morning, the first sunshine. Or sitting inside in that beautiful dining room with the big windows, looking out, seeing the birds, the fresh grass. And now remembering it. Of course, you can see the fresh grass or the brown grass, but there's something missing. One learns to have one's pleasure and joy through somebody else or with someone else. And when that is finished, there's the pain of lack, of wanting, of not having something that was so cherished, and seemingly life-giving, joy-giving. Now, we may feel cruel to call this an addiction, but I could feel a mind wandering to those things, and wandering, and then the, the zapping, pain, grief. Not even the mind wandering, seeing something and already the associations are established, the remembrances and feelings that go with it. So, when we come here, now, I shouldn't misrepresent. I, I should not ever give the impression that Waking up to where we are, being here, means no more pleasures, no more joys. That is a, a deep notion in many spiritual traditions. You should cut everything off in order to cut that ego out. I'm just reading now a magazine, What is Enlightenment? And the first article is just full of that. A, a woman teacher, a Hindu teacher in, in India, she, she travels all over, I'd heard her name before, giving of herself endlessly, seven or eight hours of touching people, uh, putting their hand on, on their heads, whispering something, encouraging, embracing, before she eats, and then a brief rest and more of that into the night, and then that the article before the interview starts, the article says, this is the one side of her, the other side is the demands put on her staff to, to annihilate that ego. Maybe sometimes just one or two hours of rest and laying bricks, and which she also participates in. Just endless exhausting work and eight hours of sitting a day to crush that ego until there's just total surrender. This is the, I, I don't know whether to say the idea behind it. I don't know whether it works. I haven't been there. So, even though one may hear this out of my talks or think it's implied or interpreted this way, I, I'm not talking about abolishing the ego. This is, I, I don't know how this is possible. Can it sort of disconnect on its own in this alive presence which sees its pitfalls clearly? and therefore a diminishing importance given to it. 
Not deliberately, but it happens that way. And also the realization that the joy of this moment need not be annihilated or denied. But if it's hung on to and made into a memory and then sort of nurtured and cultivated, then we're in trouble again. We're back in an alternate reality of remembering and wanting the remembered to happen in imagination striving for it, putting a lot of effort into it, which is a dualistic affair from the outset, because it establishes me as the efforter, as a separate thing from what I'm striving for. So, again back to, are we coming here to to find out whether there is something other than what we suffer from, want to escape from. And what one finds here, beside a beautiful place and incredible surroundings, there are also talks about paying attention to what comes up. Not constant talks about how whole we are and, and, and all of this stuff about, I, I, I don't even know right now. See. Because it's, it's mentioned, it's, it's, I can't avoid it at times. But what one finds, first of all, is talks addressed to looking at fear, at anger, at pain and grief, at this tremendous compulsion to make resolutions, to change oneself, to look deeply at that, not surface, superficial. And to see if the, the looking itself can purify itself by noticing the judgments, the prejudices, the wantings with a clear eye. And maybe finding to one's amazement that in this clear looking, things change. The pain isn't what we thought it was. I'm not what I thought I am, and you are not what I thought you were. So, coming here for moments at a time, can there be this fresh looking and listening? Not disturbed by what we want to hear and see, to see that disturbance for what it is, thought and memory. And let it dissipate in the looking and the attending in the presence with what is. A fan kicking in and humming gently. <clears throat> to learn, to discern the difference between just thinking and listening. thinking there's a fan, and where is it? Is that in the basement? What side of the basement? I wish they wouldn't have this fan. Or That is different from just humming. Can you, can you see that right now? The hum? Hear it? It's very faint. The breathing. Feel it? Or is this encased by thinking about the fan, thinking about breathing, and can one discern the difference between this encasement and a moment of free listening? And then maybe the thought again, I'm listening. Am I listening? Ah, these kind of thoughts. And see them 
as thoughts and listen again. Not to get rid of the thoughts, that's another thought, but to discern the difference between thinking and just listening. And maybe taste for moments at a time the freedom of just listening, just being, and taste the contraction of thinking and associating and emoting and paining and, and angering. And then maybe just a moment of waking up to this alternate reality. So this, this moment of waking up to it. Very crucial moment in our sitting or our daily life. At this moment of waking up to all the conditioning that has been rumbling in the body is still full of rumble. And just letting it be, not make a thing out of it. That's, that's really the art of living and sitting. Coming to, at a glance, seeing what's up or what was up and letting it be, not thinking further about it, for it or against it, but the breathing, sunning, warming, cooling. No one there. If there's a feeling there is someone there, what is that feeling? Faint thoughts and strong habits. I think, therefore, I exist. If I don't think, maybe I won't exist anymore. There are such connections. And to find maybe to one's amazement that existence is much freer and fuller if there's not this constant meanness that needs to think about itself and affirm itself and assert itself and embellish or put itself down. Another strong habit to put oneself down. Something just pops into mind. Maybe I'll, I will mention it at the close of this talk. I think it's in the book of The Awakening of Intelligence, where Krishnamurti is asked by an Indian guru, sage, something about is there spiritual development or something of, of that nature. Or maybe differences in human beings due to karma. I don't, I don't remember his side, his question so much as I remember Krishnamurti's response. And he said, there are three kinds of people. Those who are totally absorbed with ego, totally self-centered. And then there are those who are not totally self-centered. There is some space there beside self-centeredness. And then there are those where there's all space. No self-centeredness, sort of on the other shore. And then he said, I speak to them all.
We will end here for today.